Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to Full Circle for inviting me to come along. Um, oh yeah, okay, that's fine, I just wanted to check. Um, so my name's Lorna um, and I'm here to talk to you a bit about our video storytelling project which is based here in Leeds and is called Life, Loss, Learning and Legacy. So what I'm going to do today is I'll just I've got a bit of a presentation um, to keep your eyes on and I'm also going to share with you some video stories that have been made on the project so far um, and then yeah afterwards I think there'll probably be some time for some chat some Q&A or any questions that you'd like to ask so um, if you're happy to we'll just fire away so like I said my name's Lorna um, and this is our project um, we are the project is run by our charity called lippy people um, we're a video storytelling charity based in beeston in south leeds and we've been a charity for uh quite a while now actually around 20 years we've been delivering video storytelling projects and coaching video storytelling and coaching projects with communities and individuals and groups to support them to tell and share their lived experience, their stories of lived experience. And what we are particularly passionate about doing is working with groups, marginalised groups whose stories are less heard, and, um, and we want to set up the Life Lost Learning and Legacy Project in particular to create a space and an opportunity for bereaved communities to come together and to tell and share their stories of lived experience. So we began the project as a pilot in sort of 2018. And we worked with a group of carers in Leeds uh, through Carers Leeds, who are an organization here. And the aim of setting up the Life Loss Learning and Legacy Project was really to bring together, like I said, people, bereaved communities, uh, bereaved peers, together in a space where they can share their stories and lived experience um, with others and look at how they can use their experience to support others in similar situations and by doing so uh, creating video stories and you'll watch a couple of these later on. So like I said we, we piloted the project in 2018 with a mixed group of men, women and young people all who've been bereaved and um, and in this project we supported them to make seven video stories all of which can be found on our YouTube channel which I'll share the link with you later. Through this project we learned that um, it was the bereaved older men of this project in particular who really took to this project and told us that actually a space where older men can come together and talk about loss um, was quite needed because they found the men and their support services were saying that often in Leeds at least uh, bereavement support services were not seeing as many men attending them and there might be lots of different reasons for that um, including the fact that a lot of services might be run or facilitated by women and men often might not feel um, as inclined to go and also that a lot of women would attend perhaps bereavement support sessions or um, yeah, peer, peer groups uh, and other men wouldn't be there so they wouldn't necessarily feel like opening up and what might be in it for me. Um, so we decided then after that that why not really try and make this Life Loss Learning and Legacy Project a space for older men to come together. So in 2019 we started the first year of the project and began working with older men. So um, I joined the project as well in, in March 2019. So um, as a project manager, and I helped to put all the projects together and support storytellers throughout the process and uh, sort of identify partners to work with, all the sort of things to do with managing the four hours project. Um, each of the projects, uh, I'll give you a bit of a summary of how they work. So the Life Loss Learning and Legacy projects are delivered to groups um, of bereaved peers over a period of around 10 weeks. 
And these 10 weeks consist of supporting people to connect with one another, tell and share their stories, uh, listen to one another's stories. Um, and through this process, we also coach um, and support storytellers to really think about the big formative life experiences that have happened in their lives, of which loss and bereavement is often a massive one, but which is often a, a theme or, or an experience which isn't talked about very often, very openly or very easily. Um, so, and then through this 10 week process, we support storytellers to identify, would they like to make a video story about their lived experience? And if so, what would they like to do with that video story? What would their impetus be for making a video story? So I've got some photographs here as well that demonstrate a bit of what, um, what we have been doing in our project. So these are some nice photographs of work before the pandemic, when, when the Four Hours project was very much face to face. So we support men um, over, the, over the project to um, also use a lot of photographs in the process. So the process of going through photographs for men who want to make a video story is a very cathartic process. Um, it's also quite a difficult process for lots and lots of people. Um, and often involves supporting men to bring boxes out from the attics to include into their video stories. Um, and the photo on the right as well shows us bringing our editing systems. So we very much use, um, we when we were working face to face, we would do um, the editing fully with the groups where men can learn a bit about how to make a video story. Um, we talk them through how the software works. It's often quite interesting for men who've never considered themselves very technical, for example, um, and get a chance to see how their personal story can be used and brought down from a sort of one hour, one hour conversation down into sort of three or four minutes um, into a video story. The process of the Life Loss Learning and Legacy project is massively collaborative. Um, it is always um, group work. We sometimes, often, well, we'll often provide one-to-one -one support when men need it, but the aim of the Forge project is to really bring together men with similar experiences or men with different experiences to learn from one another. And in doing so, there have been some amazing friendships which have sort of sparked between uh, men. A lot of the time in the projects, men might arrive to a project knowing each other on the periphery. Maybe they've seen each other at their local uh, community centre um, or lunch club, but it's only until they start the Life Loss Learning and Legacy project and they start having conversations about um, losses and personal experience that men actually really collect, connect on a really deep level. Um, and that's been a really massive part of the project for, for the men and for us as well to see. Um, so here's just a little, yeah, a couple more pictures of the trips and the outings that we do when we'd actually meet face to face. It's quite nice to look at these photos again because we haven't worked in this way for a year now. Um, the Life Loss Learning and Legacy project um, is also very, um, one of the elements of this project is to create opportunities for men to share their video stories in wider settings. So the process of sharing stories with of, of bereavement and loss with peers is cathartic and empowering in itself, but by taking their video stories out into that wider sphere means that men start to realize that their, ex their experiences and their stories do have the power uh, to influence and support other people in similar situations. They also have the opportunity to present their videos and their stories to other professionals, for example, in who might support them. So a lot of men are really keen on the idea that their video stories are shared with, for example, um, funeral directors or um, celebrants or um, support groups uh, or GPs or people who work in healthcare because a lot of the time men have in the project have felt that they are sometimes seen as a patient or a case on, in someone's workload, but might not necessarily know the story, their backstory, uh, which 
which has led them to being in someone's care, for example. So this is just a picture of some of the feedback which we, which some of the men gave after watching video stories at the Hyde Park Picture House in November 2019. Um, a lot of the men, when they watch the video stories, just find a lot of comfort in knowing that other men are uh, feeling the same and have, uh, have been through a similar experience. So um, what I thought we could do now um, is I'd like to show two video stories. All of these video stories that you're about to watch are available to watch again online in your own time if you want to. Um, I'd also just like to say that some of the main things which we have learned on the projects up until 2020 is that, you know, like I said, the video stories have really given men an opportunity to learn about each other on a much deeper level and speak out in the open about some quite challenging topics which aren't often talked about. So for example, um, being a carer for a partner um, and um, being bereaved, um, that partner passing away. There have been quite a lot of conversations around um, which men might not have, ex have anticipated around carer's relief, a sense of relief after um, a partner has died. Um, as a result of being being a, a carer for such a long amount of time. Um, there's also been some really interesting conversations around men around it's okay to move on after loss um, and actually to not feel guilty about um, feeling joy again um, after perhaps a long illness um, of a partner. So there have been some really liberating conversations that have happened after these. Um, after this project. So if everyone's happy to, I'm going to share two video stories. Just bear with me because I'm going to have to stop stop sharing the presentation, go on to the video and then um, start again. So just bear with while I get the video lined up. Okay. So here's our first video story. I'll just make sure the volume's up nice and loud. And just bear in mind as well, when you're watching these video stories, because I'm sharing them on Zoom, they can sometimes have a little bit of lag or a little bit of delay. Um, but when you watch them yourself on YouTube afterwards, if you want to, they'll be up to speed and fine. When my father died, my uncle Jack was there at the funeral. And uh, he could see that I was upset, so he'd come along and put his arm on my shoulder and said, in his old Yorkshire way, Hey, George, uh, there's all sorts of ways of dealing, and they haven't fun of good one yet. In the 1930s, the school that I went to had 300 children go into it, and we just had deaths that occurred, not through the war, but through normal things. Uh, and uh, we accepted that, it just, just part and parcel of growing up at that time. And apart from that, it was sort of molded into the education, it was talked about in the education. We were read poetry, and most of the poetry was kind of jingoistic, always leaning towards death. We thought about death, but it was kind of accepted. I met this girl, Betty. We did a bit of courting. It meant a lot to us, really. He got a little bit keen, actually. A little boy came along, and he was about a month old, and had to go for medical. I was A1 fit, so naturally I had to go into the army. Although he knew that there were incidents going on in the Middle East, he knew there were incidents going on all over the world. Because you were a trained soldier, and because you were with other lads that were trained soldiers, it didn't seem to matter that much saying about this death business. The person that suffered most, as they say, are the people that are left behind because they don't know what's happening. They put two and two together and come up with a different answer entirely. You're in jeopardy. My wife's family, the Irvings, had lost, and Mrs. Irving had lost two of her sons during the war and one badly injured. And they saw it from that point of view. I went back to being an ordinary civilian lad with a family and having to provide everything that 
you do provide a home and a livelihood, that was it. And thus we went on and, and life took on that pattern from there. It was obvious that something was wrong. She was losing her strength and her breathing was getting a lot worse. And then a couple of days later, I had to get the doctor in again and said, we think that Mrs. Lewis is in a lot of pain. We think that Mrs. Lutis should go to an hospice. And of course, there it's a means to an end. She was taken to bed and I chatted with her and the nurses chatted with her and she kept spirit as much as she could. And then per se, one night, it was about seven o'clock in the evening. And uh, I noticed the breathing was getting a little bit laboured and faint, and she had chatted away, and she stopped chatting to me, smiled, I held her hand, and I was talking away there, as I'm talking away now, and the, the nurse that was sat by me said, I'm afraid she's gone, George, and I didn't realise that, uh, and it was a, a blow then, I, I realised then that I was on my own, and life starts afresh then, or it doesn't. For a while it doesn't anyway. You're lost. You're looking for other people. And of course, there are other people. There was my family there. They were rallied around. People came and people went. And I found throughout it, oddly enough, that women that I hadn't bothered about how they felt of one thing and another were the best at that particular moment in time, during that particular period, because Women were not afraid of coming up and putting their arms around you and saying, oh dear George, I'm terribly sorry. And I found that men didn't do that. They were sorry, and I could see that they were sorry, but they would sort of say, well, lad, that's it, pull yourself together kind of thing. When I'd been in the army, I met a lad who'd spent a great deal of time in China, and he learned me saying that they had in China. And it was, you can't stop the bird of sorrow from hovering over your head, but you can stop it from nesting in your hair. Some men, they had kids of their own, but didn't get involved. They never saw the dad sometimes, unless he was on his way to work or coming home. Whereas my dad, when I was involved, was everything, you know. And I mean everything. My dad had five sons, and they were proud of us all. He couldn't have been no more proud. He was sort of, these are my lads, you know. And if all went wrong, oh, it'll be Dalton boys, and they were always there to defend us, though, but always the do Sometimes it was. He never has a lot of money, didn't we, have? because, as you can imagine, bringing five up, his main job from British Rail, but then again, for the cinema, the work projectionist, so he to come home from work, have his tea, get washed and changed, go to the cinema and start showing the film. He was in home guard and, uh, and then train the football team. I just can't imagine anything that he didn't do. That like air cutting, start with all this one, work is down. And it wasn't just the base that he plonked on, it was, it was all this, you know, it would be moaned. And the next night he'd come home from work. I want your shoes and boots, and he'd repair all the shoes and boots the next night. And bath night, it was like a sheep dip. All five of us in the bathroom. Christmas, he used to trim up the house. I'll trim his up and Christmas tree, and then he'd get a piece of soap right on the mirror. Merry Christmas to all and Happy New Year, you know. And when I started going with my wife, she saw him do it. She said, his handwriting's fantastic, you know. But she what? Christmas, he always used to get a, they called it a pin. It was something like nine gallon, it all did the pin, you know. He used to bring that home and he used to tap it himself. What he used to do it. We'd get a sack, put all in it to go over, bung at top, wet the sacks, keep the vehicle, you know. And 
used to just go down and you can make shandies, you know. But lads used to go down and help him because they said he didn't need no help if the subject is sell. He was getting jobs on railway, you know, where they'd done everything and they were retiring. So I said, well, what we're going to buy him was a retirement gift, you know. So nobody's come up with any ideas. So I said, what about the lights? And I've been engraved. Yeah, that sounds all right, our kids. So me and my eldest brother went and got it. And I said to the lady at the shop, can you do an inscription? She said, well, yeah, what do you want on it? So I said to the old block from his five chips. But God, she said, that's a bit touching. So when he finished Friday night, we all went to the old head on the vest. And uh, we bought him a cigar. So I gave him five sons, five daughter in laws, you know. And we all sat there like, so give him a cigar. He's fumbling in his pocket. So I said, What are you doing now? So I can't find my matches. So I said, Well, try this. So we gave him lights. So, well, that would do. He just, he just filled up, you know. And uh, very emotional, you know, for a few of us. And I found it a few months ago, and I just looked at it and I was, I was a bit upset, like, so I've got it in my pocket now, you know. They were unbelievable. Not a thing did he struggle with, you know. Whatever he wanted to do, he was there to help you, you know. So try it this way, kid. I mean, everybody has a dad, don't they, you know. But my dad was just a remarkable man. So I'm just going to share this, the screen again now. Sorry about that. So we're back. So I just want to give a little bit of um, a bit of a background to Barry's story as well. So um, when I think of video storytelling, when I think of storytelling, I often think about Barry, uh, whose video you just watched. Barry is a perfect example of how everyone has a story and I think Barry, when, when I watch that video every time, I think what a beautiful storyteller Barry is because he really wanted to take part in the Life Lost Learning and Legacy Project in July of 2019. And at this time, Barry was um, in palliative care. He was receiving treatment for cancer and he really wanted to take part in a project where he could just meet with some other men, go down to the local community centre and meet with us and also have a project and a couple of moments where he could think about what approaching his end of life meant for him, what legacy he wanted to leave behind um, and what stories he wanted to leave behind for his family. So when Barry said he wanted to make a video story about his dad and he had lots of photographs and a lighter that he wanted to incorporate into his video story um, of course we just went ahead and did it with him and as a result Barry made this really moving video story and since Barry died in October 2019 his family have seen his video story as well and have fed back to us that they're just so glad that Barry took part in the project and that they've also now got this video story of Barry um, of their dad and their granddad which they can look back at uh, because Barry always felt that his children didn't know enough about his his own dad and his own growing up and there are some things which you need to share with your family before you die so that was sort of Barry's reason behind making his video story I just wanted to share that with you so um 
now we are fast forward to uh, March 2020 when the start of the pandemic uh, sort of began and we on the Life Loss Learning and Legacy Project thought how can we continue to run the 4Ls project at this time, at this time when we anticipate that the world is going to experience so much loss and at the moment it won't just be older men who we are thinking of as particularly socially isolated perhaps and who are bereaved but the whole world the whole of the UK the whole of Leeds is going through social isolation in some way so we reached out to our older beneficiaries like the older men we worked with in 2019 uh, and asked them will you try this with us will you try and take the four hours project online um, this involves using a new program that we've just found out called Zoom. Um, can you give it a go with us? So thankfully, a group of older men, including George from the first video and a number of others worked with us to test Zoom and trial the 4 Ls project online. Um, and as a result, there were uh, months of supporting 25 older bereaved and socially isolated men in Leeds um, to get online and I wanted to include these pictures because they sum up a lot of what I was doing and a lot of what the project was doing around uh, getting men like Eric um, online and Eric was able to borrow a tablet from his organisation called Sage and Mesmac in Leeds who were older men's uh, older gay men support organization uh, and as a result of some uh, dedication on his part and willingness to give it a go Eric got on to Zoom after about a month with me and his support worker and as a result Eric took part in the Life Loss Learning and Legacy project and has also made a video story um, which is available on, on YouTube um, and Eric's 89 and I just wanted to say kudos to, to Eric because him and so many other men were really willing to take part in the Four Rails project because they could see um, the benefits that it would have on them. So here's just a couple of little photographs of, of our first sort of six months I think um, of doing Life Loss Learning and Legacy projects in 2020 online. Um, by December we have we delivered 10 Life Loss Earning and Legacy projects online uh, with groups of older men who've been carers. We've worked with and supported um, men who've been bereaved by suicide. Um, a group of South Asian women who've been bereaved. We've worked with young adults, um, older women, and we've also done uh, our first intergenerational project, which brought together um, older women and men and a group of younger women as well to have conversations around personal stories of loss and bereavement. And I'm going to share one of these video stories with you if we've got enough time as well. So, as I said, over the period of 2020, we delivered 10 Life Loss Learning and Legacy projects online which were exactly the same format uh, around 10 weeks of weekly meeting up uh, in peer groups sharing stories listening to stories connecting and making video stories and as a result um, 66 video stories and vlogs have been made by um, people on the life loss learning and legacy project um, all most of these are available on, on our YouTube channel. And these video stories, since they've been made, have been really uh, useful and insightful tools, I think, for quite a lot of others, not only the men who, who, were, who made them and were part of the project, but since they've been made, um, quite a few organisations, both locally uh, and also nationally, have been using these video stories as tools as resources within their own services. Um, for example, um, they've been used last week um, by a partner at AGK Leeds 
around grief awareness training for some of their staff uh, because we've we've learned that um, a couple of colleagues and partners in the city have said that they often are in roles um, professional roles where they do support people who are bereaved every day but yet don't might not quite necessarily know how to have conversations might not know necessarily how to support that individual but by watching a couple of video stories like these ones they're able to understand um, a bit of what an individual might have been through to know which sort of themes or topics uh, people appreciate being spoken to about um, and, we, and a couple of video stories are also currently being used um, to support a suicide awareness campaign in West Yorkshire. They've also been used in um, lots of different other settings as well. And that's just a really nice outcome, which we always hoped for. But to see it now happening in 2020 uh, is, is really exciting. And it's also, we, this, is only, this is only able to happen um, if the storytellers want this to happen. So a big feature about the Four Worlds project is not only supporting groups to come together and share stories and make video stories, but to also decide themselves, what do they want to do with their video stories? Who do they want their video stories to impact? What messages do they want to share by making these video stories? So, yeah, I just want to check that we've got enough time. I'll probably make it, wrap it up soon so we've got enough time for you to ask any questions. I just want to show you a couple more of pictures. So uh, this is, gives an example of how we're still able to do the video editing online using Zoom. So we use the share screen function. Um, this is an example of how we edit our video stories um, in a group. Um, this is our editing software share screened and uh, it's in this editing software that we're able to drop in photographs, edit the video stories, um, include any music, for example, that you've just seen. And then again, that's an example of us looking at um, a Leeds archive for one of the men's video stories who wanted to include a photograph. Um, also in 2020, as part of our delivery, we've been running some really exciting uh, screening events uh, of which we've run five across 2020. Um, they started off with around 10 to 12 people joining in July and watching sets of video stories and having conversations and the idea behind these screening events is to share a set of three or four video stories a bit like today and after each video is shown creating opportunity for people to reflect um, and have a conversation after each video. They've been really popular and really successful and they're incredibly liberating for the storytellers um, to share their videos in settings where um, counsellors can attend, funeral directors can attend, family can attend, um, friends. And it's that opportunity, it's that space for Storytellers, everyday people with lived experience can speak to professionals who they might not normally speak to. Um, so they've been a really amazing feature of sort of 2020. Um, and our last session, which we had um, about two weeks ago, which Full Circle Females have been supporting uh, by co-hosting, um, we had about 45 people attending and they were just really excited for the storytellers to see that their videos are making a wider impact in not only in Leeds but also nationally. So I'm just aware that it's 20 to um, 12. I've got two more video stories I wanted to share. Um, is um, to full circle funerals, can you just go on off mute and just tell me if you're happy to if I share too much? Sorry, yes, I was giving you a very enthusiastic thumbs up. Yes, please do. If you've got them to share, that would be lovely. Okay. And then we've still got time for a chat. Yeah. All right. Okay. So again, bear with me while I just set up the video sharing. Uh, 
Okay. Sorry, this is just quite faffy to do. <laughs> okay. Can you, Sarah, can you just confirm that you can see the black screen? Uh, I can, we can currently see the four videos um, sort of on your documents folder. Okay. Not quite, I'm so glad you're doing this rather than me. <laughs> it's nothing more stressful than typing or doing anything on a computer yeah, yeah. with everyone watching you. So, um, I do. Yeah. And then it might just be loading. Yeah, let's just have a little look. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have we got have we got the black screen now? Mm, no. no, not yet. Let me try something else. This happens all the time. <laughs> oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. yeah, don't worry. Um, hang on. Well, there's no rush, and if people need to go, you know, of course, people yeah, can make their own their own exit. I've never been brave enough to share a video on Zoom. Oh, I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess you kind of have to with your project. Okay. Yeah, black like screen, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so these next two videos I'm going to show are ones that have been made um, during 2020 and working remotely. Um, this, this first video is um, part, part of an intergenerational project, which we did in uh, August 2020, with three young women and three older uh, residents of an MHA scheme in Huddersfield. Um, and then the second video I'll show is was made around um, December uh, with Leeds Mind in partnership. So, okay, let's watch Sophie's story. A year and a year and a half ago, I had some kind of profound impacts associated with loss from like both granddads from both separate sides of the family. One of them was very sudden and another one was very drawn out and long. And up until this point, I hadn't really lost anyone really close to me. And the loss over time had quite a significant impact on my well-being, my mental health and how I saw the rest of the world as well. I slowly started to kind of descend into a pit of quite awful depression. I was so away from myself that I could not be my own person anymore. It was almost as if I was standing on the precipice of this deep hole and the, the grief of losing my second granddad pushed me over the edge and I just was free falling into just complete darkness. I couldn't see anything else other than the loss. I lost a lot of myself, my happiness. I could not see happiness in the world much anymore it was just overwhelming I told my mum I just don't want to feel anything anymore because it was so painful to feel everything that I was feeling at that time I couldn't imagine how to get out of this rut of being so all-encompassingly sad all the time so I ended up taking part in some CBT therapy it enlightened me in the sense that I realized that whilst it was about the grief and the grief had put me in that position. There were so many other things that had existed in my life that I hadn't processed, that almost the grief pushed me over the edge. I could feel myself, who I was as a person, how I normally am, how I interact, my confidence, my happiness was around me, but I just couldn't connect with it anymore and not being able to see hope in anything that I had, not being able to see love, and success it was just sadness I then attended a grief group therapy session to help me process the grief and I was surrounded by people similar age group to me who had lost grandparents who had lost parents who had lost significant partners in their life and whilst I thought it would be too hard it actually was so rewarding for me to be able to connect with people on another level who were going through the same thoughts and feelings that I was at the same time. Listening to their stories made me reflect on the things that I had been through, but in the sense that I could process them better and I slowly got better. 
you know, I climbed out of the pit and I gained more control of myself. I have not felt this way in so long that it's hard to conceptualize feeling good and feeling happy. And I feel myself again. I don't feel this other person on a shell anymore. I think I didn't know before that I had a problem and that I didn't know that in myself that I was creating behaviours and pathways to make myself worse. I didn't accept that I was part of the issue, I suppose, and I was part of this system of feeling bad. I started to understand that I didn't have to hide myself anymore from my friends, my family, and how I was feeling, because almost the grief allowed that one time to open up because everyone was opening up about how they're feeling. And whilst I was opening up about my grief, I was also opening up about the, the things I'd been feeling other than that. And the grief has shown me the resilience that I can have. It has given me a positive experience in the sense that I am a better person than before grief. Julie met in 1973. I was about 17 or 18. She would have been about 16. And shortly after that, we started dating. And fully enough, I just knew right from the start that she was right for me and the rest of the history. We went out with each other for about five years. And in 1978, when we got married, we were married for 42 years in total, had three children, had a wonderful life together. She was so good at caring for people. She was so selfless. Towards the end of last year, I did notice she was becoming more forgetful. Late in February, I got a message from Julie's close friend asking me whether there was something wrong with Julie because she seemed like she, felt like she had a brain fog. That's when I got Julie an appointment almost straight away. This was just prior to lockdown. And the doctor started asking her questions about her health. She asked her if she was depressed and she said no. And she said then that she was going to do this cognitive test. I think that Julie wasn't in the right frame of mind to do that test. And it might have been just a bad day. Her diabetes might have been raging, her sugar levels may have been high. Um, so when she when it came to us ask, answering the question, she maybe wasn't in a, you know, the frame of mind to concentrate on answering it properly. And it was a few days after that that she received the, the letter inviting a further test from the younger persons with dementia team. My wife was 62 and the doctor was talking about early onset dementia. And that, if you do get it at that age, is quite devastating. I tried to play it down a bit and say, look, we're only just trying to just look at the possibilities. But what she wrote in a personal diary was that she read a shocking letter from the hospital. They think I've got dementia. And that was how her mind was thinking at the time. And that appointment was set for the 7th of May. And that coincidentally was the day after Julie took her own life. After she died, obviously COVID had a massive impact on me and on the family, on our ability to mourn. The funeral was limited to 10 people. And even then, her mum, who was 95, she was advised to socially distance. So she, she sat in like... Her, um, a different part of the crematorium to everybody else. And although it was a nice service and there were some nice words spoken, it wasn't the same without the support of more family and friends. I was reasonably confident that I could deal with the inquest. I had no illusion about the inquest itself, that it was just a formality that everybody had to go through by law. I was told they wanted an account from me of what happened with Julie. I sat down and I just started writing some background notes and then circumstances leading up to Julie's death, some relevant issues and some lessons learned. When we went into the inquest, the coroner explained that the purpose of the inquest is to ascertain how a person died and not why they died. And that um, that's all the law requires. He has to deal with facts. So when I say this may have led to 
he was suicidal or not, he would say, yeah, but that's conjecture. And this is a legal thing. Unless you've got a legal mind, you just know what is right and what is wrong. And something that seems relevant to us might in the court of law not be relevant because it's conjecture. People ask me what was the outcome, and the outcome was that Julie took her own life, and we knew that right from the start. So that wasn't a revelation. So really, it's just a way of closing the book, and, and that's how we deal with it. There's been a lot of talk about the impact of COVID on people's mental health, and it didn't need a letter from the English persons with dementia team to carry out further tests. They could have done further tests without even mentioning the word dementia. That just opened up a whole can of worms and something Julie was having to live with during the COVID period when there was not a lot going on in her life. Had she sort of gone into that COVID period and been going about a normal routine, she'd have probably been too busy to dwell on it and even worry about it. She would have just been doing what she normally did, which was looking after other people. So I wanted to share those two video stories with you in particular because they, they explore and reveal quite a lot of the conversations that were being had around last year, around the Full Wells Project, around mental health and the impact of COVID on so many people's lives in ways that we might not really be thinking about. So not only the fact that COVID is taking so many lives, but it's also having a massive effect on people's mental health and resulting also in, in suicides and, and loss of suicide. So I wanted to share those two with you. And I'm just gonna quickly share back to the presentation and then, then we can sort of, um, then we can just close off and have a bit of a chat. So I just want to let everyone know that the Video stories made on the Life Lost Learning and Legacy project are, um, majority of them are all available on the Lippy People and our YouTube channel. Um, and these have all been given, the storytellers have all given their permission for, the, for these videos to be out there, to be online, for people to watch, listen to, learn from them and, and use them in any way that you think you see fit, whether that's in your personal life, um, to share it with someone who in person you might think might relate and find them useful but also professionally as well um, so these are all available I'll put the link at the end we've also got our website where um, video stories are and you can find out more about the work that we're doing um, and we're also on Twitter so feel free to reach out to us and let us know how you found the session and please just stay connected with us our project is funded. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this project unless we had the support of funders. So these are just some of the great funders who've helped us be able to run this project. Um, and here are some links for um, all of those websites that I've just shown you. So I think that well, that's me done. I know we're quite close to the end, so I'll. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen and then maybe send these links around to everyone uh, afterwards.